Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. I think we can start. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, I think some people might just be going in right now. So um, hi and good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar session where I'll be presenting about a topic uh, called Mental Health for All, Striving for Equal Care in an Unequal World. So my name is Hanani. I'm a mental health coach in Naluri. And I've been working with Naluri for over two and a half years within the field of coaching, uh, digital coaching mainly. Um, and so today, I think this topic is very close to um, this month um, theme of mental health and also the World Mental Health Day, right? So um, with today's webinar session, I think it's in line with the theme of uh, World Mental Health Day that is on uh, Tuesday, the 10th 10, 10 of October. And so I believe that this is a platform and also a time for us to come together to show our importance and also understanding and raising awareness about mental health. Because sometimes, you know, like um, you never know whether you might be brushing shoulders with someone who is struggling internally, someone who might be hiding a battle inside and someone who might be afraid to seek out and reach out for support. So I believe that this is a time for us to, um, to normalize talking about mental health itself and to have open conversations uh, and to not be afraid to come forward if we are struggling uh, with our own mental health, okay? All right, so before I start, I just wanted to share some uh, housekeeping rules um, before we get started. So what you can expect uh, throughout this webinar session. Um, so feel free to ask your questions uh, in the chat box and participate in some of the polls and quizzes that I'll be sharing. And feel free to share your thoughts, your ideas, your feedback um, in the chat box on the right side of the screen. And if there are any questions for me, you can type in Hanani before writing your questions uh, to direct your questions to me. Okay. And if you want to remain anonymous, uh, you can uh, send a private message to me instead in the channel. Yep. And also hands out will be available to download on the tab on the right hand side of the screen. And this presentation will also be shared as a PDF document uh, for you to take home later on. Okay. All right. So um, before I start, I also just wanted to introduce myself again for those who just came into uh, the session today. So my name is Hanani. I'm a Naluri mental health coach. And I've been working with Naluri for over two and a half years already within the scope of coaching and also supporting individuals who come to, do, to the Naluri app for concerns like weight management, stress management, um, or general well-being in that sense. So I graduated with a master's of degree in health psychology and a bachelor of science in psychology. And my area of interest lies mainly within the scope of stress management, uh, self-compassion, self-growth and development, and also community health. All right, so um, let's get started. So just to share a bit about the agenda that I'll be sharing more of today. So I'll be talking a bit more about introducing what is mental health. What are the risk factors that we can look out for if someone is struggling with their mental health? What are the warning signs that we need to be mindful of, right? And uh, we'll look a bit more into the prevalence of mental health disorders across the globe. And then what are the current challenges to mental health care and mental health support? And finally, how can we as individuals, as a community, as a society, become better mental health advocates in our community? Okay, so I, I guess when it comes to mental health, um, there's so many highlights and spotlight that is being directed towards mental health, especially after the pandemic had happened, after COVID-19, right? So um, you may have heard about mental health from your friends and family, um, from work, from school or uh, from social media in general. So each of us, we, we may have different perceptions of what is mental health. And so before I begin, right, I just wanted to get the ball rolling. And I wanted to ask the audience today, what does mental health mean to you? Right, so feel free to type in the chat. I would love to hear your responses. 
uh, and see what you have to say. There's no right or wrong. So feel free to type in uh, what you feel mental health means to you. Okay, so I can see um, Fazila already writing our EQ, okay? So anyone else that would like to share? <clears throat> Okay, so free of mental illness, peace of mind, state of mind. Okay, I can see a lot more uh, answers coming in already. So mental health means having health, happy mind, good EQ, being emotionally intelligent, uh, being at peace with ourselves. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, so mental health represents our body health, right? Peace and stable emotion. Okay, so the condition in how we are thinking, regulating emotions and also handling stress. Okay, happiness. All right, so yeah, peace and health. So I, I can see that a lot more people are putting in um, the general answers of emotional health, psychological health, managing stress and so on, right? So when it comes to mental health, it refers to a state of well-being. So it refers to our ability to cope with the stresses of our life, uh, to function and be productive in all aspects of our life, like our work, our personal life and so on and also to be able to connect and form meaningful relationship with other people and, uh, and with our own social circle, right? And also to contribute to the larger community with our skill sets, with our expertise and so on. And when it comes to mental health, right, it affects how we think, how we feel, and how we respond and behave as a response to that, right? So for example, uh, two people might be going through the same kind of stress in their daily life but they can have very different responses to it right so for example two people might be going through um, a normal traffic jam in the morning and one person might be seeing it as a form of me time for them to to have some personal time before they go to work and the other person might see it as a daily nuisance or a daily hassle for them every day before they go to work right so the way they react the way they feel is influenced by how they think of the situation that they are in, right? And then thirdly, mental health is universal. Everyone, including you, including me, we all have mental health, right? So it is more uh, common than we think. And a lot of us, sometimes, we tend to equate mental health with mental illness, but that is not necessarily the case. Because when you have mental illness, that is more towards the severe end of the spectrum, where you may need professional help, you may need further assessments, you may need further diagnosis. For that and talking about spectrum uh, i think i will talk a bit more of this um, in this next slide okay all right so one of the things that's also important to note when we talk about mental health is also the mental health spectrum or the mental health continuum so each and every one of us we fall under one of these categories at one point in time and our mental health can fluctuate from the green zone to the red zone, to the yellow zone, to the orange zone at any point in time, given the type of resources that we have, given our coping skills and the type of support that we have at that, at that time, right? Um, and so when it comes to the green zone, so this is the healthy zone, right? So what are some of the signs and uh, things that you can look out for when you are um, at your optimum state of mental health. So this is where you're, you have normal mood fluctuations, you are performing well, you are physically and also socially active. And then we go on to the yellow zone, right? So this is the zone where you may experience some sort of irritability or you have low energy, uh, you may have trouble sleeping. And so um, you might notice that there are some minor changes in um, how you react or how you respond to stress. So even though you are in the green and also yellow zone, it does not mean that you are not experiencing any form of stress, right? So there are some type of stress that you are um, going through, but the main key point here is that you are able to cope and also manage with it, right? And then we go on to the um, orange zone. So this is the zone where you are probably struggling and individuals who may be in this particular zone uh, you can see the signs that they may not be performing as well at work and they may have um, commented or shared that they feel very tired all the time. They have increased fatigue and lethargy 
and also finally they might feel restless or they have disturbed sleep patterns all right and then we go on to the um the last part which is unwell so this is where uh individuals might have outbursts or meltdown they may not know how to regulate or manage their emotions so so they start to shout or they start to yell they start to throw tantrums to other people and also it is uh, characterized by the inability to function i think this is highlighted because this is the main point for this um, particular zone if individuals are in this particular zone it is harder for them to function and also be able to do the daily tasks that they need to do to perform well at work and to build um, connections and relationships and finally if it is more at the severe end this is where individuals may start to experience um, suicidal ideations suicidal thoughts and so on And at each part of this particular mental health continuum, there are support available. And the type of support that is available is also dependent on where you are at. So for those who may be in the green and also yellow zone, the type of support that may be suitable would be maintaining a good self-care habit and routines, um, having good social support network. And for those who may be under the orange and also red zone, this is where um, reaching out to professional care or mental health professionals is a more better support for them. Okay. All right. So um, I think the other thing that I wanted to share also is why are we talking about mental health and why is mental health important nowadays, right? So mental health is an important aspect of our overall well-being, right? So it leads to better physical health. When we talk about mental health and physical health, sometimes people tend to put it in two separate boxes. So mental health is in one box, uh, physical health is in another box, right? They don't merge or connect the dots between these two. When in reality, our physical health is also impacting our mental health and vice versa, right? So um, for example, when you have uh, anxiety, for instance, right? you might experience physical symptoms like muscle tension, your heart starts to beat faster than usual, your breathing also starts to be faster and you start to go to the toilet more often than you, uh, than you usually do. And so those are physical signs that you are experiencing um, some sort of mental health um, distress at that point in time, right? And so the second point is that mental health actually leads to better and healthier relationships. So when you are able to take care of yourself, you are able to uh, be at, at your optimum level of mental health. You are also able to show up fully for other people, right? So you are able to form a healthier and also more meaningful relationships. You are able to support other people better because you are in uh, a good headspace, right, at the moment. And then number three, um, so mental health can also be important for better productivity. Okay, so we, when we talk about better productivity, so this is about performing at work, you are able to focus, you are able to manage your workload and tasks that's given by your, I don't know, superior or manager, and you are able to um, be more resilient in that sense. And finally, quality of life. So all these aspects, um, better physical health, healthier relationships, better productivity, all this will add up to create a better quality of life for individuals who uh, take care and um, find mental health important in their daily life, right? So when your mental health is good, you are able to also contribute to the community. You are also able to do the things that are meaningful and purposeful for you, right? Okay. And now, um, so let's go a bit into like the risk factors that are influencing or making someone more likely to experience mental health distress or a mental health condition, right? So when we talk about risk factors, these are characteristics that makes an individual more likely to develop a mental health condition, right? So what are the points that we need to look out for? So one of it is biological. So your genetics, your family history. So if there is somebody in the family who has um, a history of mental health condition also that can also be a factor that can be contributing and physical health so um, in my line of work of coaching um, 
I do get a lot of um, clients who share with me that they have an active lifestyle. They used to do um, a lot of active um, active activities previously, right? But then because of certain injuries, um, because of certain um, incidents that had happened, they had to limit those activities. And that can create a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety for them because part of their daily routines are actually taken away from them, right? So that can also be a risk factor. And then when we talk about psychological, personality is one thing, right? So individuals who have type A personality, for instance, so type A personality is individuals who are very ambitious. Uh, they are very competitive at work. They want to achieve the best. They can also be quite a perfectionist at times. And they usually have high expectations of themselves. So when they have high expectations, this is when it can create a lot of stress for them to meet and also achieve those standards of expectations that they've set, right? So coping skills is another aspect. So how you cope with stress, for instance, can, can be a great factor to, um, to see how you manage it in the long run, right? So if you have healthy coping skills, you have people to turn to, um, that can be a protective factor. But if you don't, that can also lead to more stress um, if not managed properly. And also your attitudes and belief so some people, they may have um, this mindset that it's very um, weak to show emotions or to be vulnerable. So that can create um, a barrier for, for them to seek help, right? And to reach out for support. And then finally, social. So work-related stress, things like uh, having high amount of workload and also managing expectations, uh, setting boundaries at work. If this is not being managed or being done properly, it can lead to a lot of stress and also anxiety for individuals. Life events can also be another factor. So going through a divorce, going through um, the death of a loved one, and also financial crisis can also be uh, a risk factor to experiencing mental health distress and also relationship issues like um, breakups and also um, conflicts in that, in that relationship. Okay, so what are some of the warning signs that we do need to look out for, right? Sometimes we want to help, but we don't know what to look out for. Like what are the signs and symptoms that someone is struggling, right? We might see that uh, maybe our coworker or our friend is not like themselves, but we don't really know what kind of things to look out for. So here I outlined a few things that you can look out for or you can be mindful of when you notice uh, some changes in the people around you, right? So number one, sleep or appetite changes. So when we talk about um, sleep or appetite changes, this is when there is a drastic change in, the, um, in you or in uh, the other person's uh, sleep patterns or they don't, they don't uh, feel the need to eat or they eat too much or when you ask them to go out for lunch, they decline. So it's, it's a subtle sign that you can actually look, look out for, right? And mood changes. So some people, when they are going through something, um, they are going through a challenge with their mental health, they can also experience greater irritability. They might be more agitated and they might lash out or like I mentioned previously, they might go into tantrums or outbursts in that sense, right? And then thirdly, social withdrawal. So this is when a lot of people who are experiencing maybe like anxiety or depression, they prefer to withdraw and also isolate themselves from the um, social circles, from their family, from their friends. And if you notice this, then it might be a sign that they are going through something in their life. All right. So uh, number four, drop in functioning. So this is another big factor. If you notice that you are not able to focus at work or you're not able to do the daily tasks that you normally do, or it's just very, very hard to, to even get out of bed, for instance, or to do something for yourself, then um, that may be a sign that we need to be mindful and be aware of. And finally, difficulty in concentrating and thinking. So a lot of people who are going through a mental health challenge or mental health distress, they have trouble to concentrate, right? They have trouble to focus on tasks and also to uh, make decisions in that sense because their mind is very clouded with all these negative thoughts, with all these negative things in their head, right? 
So if you notice that several of the following are happening or occurring, so it might be uh, helpful to follow up with a mental health professional in that sense. Okay. All right, so um, I would like to make this session more interactive, right? So uh, I do have um, several quizzes that I had come up with for you all to um, share your answers and responses with me. So um, number one, why is it important to take care of our mental health? So given what I shared just now, so A, better physical health. B, better productivity, C, healthier relationships, or D, all of the above? Okay, so I'm, I'm just waiting for the answers to come. I can see a lot of people um, putting all of the above. Okay, so. All right, okay. So I, I think the, the answers is coming in still, right? Okay. All right. Okay. Yep. So the answer is D, all of the above. So it leads to better physical health. It leads to better productivity. It leads to healthier relationships. And lastly, the one that is not in here is uh, leads to better quality of life. Right. So number two, um, yeah, I think we can go to the next question. So does mental health exist on a continuum? Yes. No. None of the above. Which one is the answer? Okay, so I see a few people putting no, uh, a lot, uh, yeah, putting 96%, putting yes. Okay, so yeah, I think I'll, I'll wait for a few more people to answer. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you so much for uh, your answers, guys. Uh, so yes, the answer is, a, yes, um, mental health does exist on a continuum ranging from healthy to unwell, right? So at any point in time, our mental health can fluctuate and we are all at risk of going from the green zone to the red zone, back to the yellow zone. And it all depends on the type of protective factors and support that we have during that time, right? And number three, which of the following is not an example of a social risk factor to mental health? Number number one, work-related stressors, B, uh, genetic, C, life events, or D, relationship issues. Right. Okay, so this might be a trick question to some people. So I, yeah, but I think uh, all of you managed to get the right answers. So let's wait a few more seconds for the rest to give their responses. Okay, so yeah, so the answer is B, genetic. So genetic is a biological risk factor, right? So the rest of these are social risk factors like work-related stressors, uh, life events, and also the relationship issues, okay? Uh, and finally, what are some of the warning signs that we need to look out for when we are checking in with our mental health? So A, sleep or appetite change, B, mood changes, C, drop in functioning, or D, all of the above. Okay. All right. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really happy to see the answers. So it shows that you have um, paying attention to for from the previous slide so thank you um okay so i think uh, the answers are still coming in so okay we can wait a bit for that um okay so i noticed a few people putting in mood changes b so that that is right um, the right answer is actually D, so all of the above. So sleep or appetite changes, mood changes, drop in functioning. These are all things that can be warning signs that can determine whether someone is struggling with their mental health, right? Okay, so I think we can proceed to the next slide. Thank you so much, everyone, for your responses and for participating in this quiz. Don't worry, we have another one after this, so uh, stay tuned, right? 
Okay, so now we are going to look a bit more into the prevalence of mental health disorders around the globe and also across the Southeast um, Asian region, right? So globally, it is estimated that 917 million or one in eight people were living with a mental health disorder. And globally, about 80% of all people living with a mental health disorder resides in lower middle income countries. So these are countries with a lack of in infrastructure and facilities um, to mental health, right? So they may have um, high demands for individuals to seek support with mental health, but the supply is uh, decreasing or there is a shortage of supply and services that are available. So when this happens, it creates a lot of disparity in terms of individuals who need support are not getting it at a timely manner. So a lot of the cases, they go underreported, right? And um, it can create a lot of uh, gap in terms of the treatment that is needed. And then in both males and females, anxiety and depressive disorders are actually the two most common mental health disorders that uh, we can see right now. And then uh, the most, I think the most uh, saddening thing and uh, discouraging thing um, to, to see is that only 2% of health budgets on average go to mental health. So it can still be seen that more efforts are needed from all sectors, including the government sectors, um, the corporate sectors, the NGOs to come together um, to create more funding, fundings for mental health and, uh, and services. In terms of the prevalence in Southeast Asia, right? So in Southeast Asia, 13.2% or one in every four people are living with a mental health disorders. So that is 260 million out of 970 million people, right? And uh, within the Asia and Pacific regions, the five leading mental health conditions, are uh, namely depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, suicidal behavior and also substance abuse disorder. And a lot of factors can come into play when it comes to uh, these aspects, right? So the high cost of living, um, relationship issues, economic uncertainties can all, all be a, a risk factor for, um, for this, right? Okay, so now I will um, share a bit more about the challenges to mental health care. So now we can see from the statistics and also the data, the disparity of mental health services um, and support is still, um, is still present, right? So there is still a treatment gap around the world. And what are some of the challenges that we face when it comes to reaching out for support with mental health? And one of it, like um, I shared earlier, was shortage of services. So in a lot of places, formal mental health services simply do not exist. And if they do exist, they are often inaccessible, right? So what this means is that most of the mental health services, they are often concentrated in psychiatric hospitals or in urban or major city areas, right? So the rural populations, often they cannot or choose not to go because of the cost. And also the cost of treatment can be a barrier to seeking support, right? So there's many, there's many barriers for them to, to seek out help and to seek out support and even transportation fees and can be, you know, transportation costs can be very costly and expensive for them to go out and seek treatment in that sense. And even now, like the, um, like if, if you were to go to uh, see a psychologist or psychiatrist, there tends to be a long waiting time or waiting appointment. So individuals who needs help at that point, may not be getting the support in a timely manner, right? So then it leads to their conditions worsening and so on. So there's a lot I think we can do within our community in order to help decrease this gap, right? And then uh, the second part is also a low mental health literacy. So mental health literacy refers to knowledge and belief about mental health conditions, which aid the recognition, management, and also prevention of mental health uh, conditions. So individuals who may have not been informed about what is mental health, what are the signs, what are the symptoms that we need to look out for, it can also be quite misleading and can lead to misunderstanding, right? So low mental health literacy often leads to the inability to identify 
early warning signs and also the inability to identify when uh, to seek help and also support. And also another big factor that is important for us to consider is that cultural differences can also influence help-seeking behavior, right? So for example, in a lot of our Asian cultures, it's not very common, right, um, for individuals to express their emotions openly, right? Sometimes um, it may be seen as a sign of weakness to even cry or to show your emotions or to say how you're feeling. So when this happens, it can create a lot of um, barriers for people to, to seek out help and it can also create a lot of stigma in that sense, right? And so when we talk about stigma itself, this is the third point that I wanted to share with you all today, all right? So stigma refers to discrediting, devaluing, and also shaming of a person because of characteristics that they possess. And I think what is most dis discouraging um, is that we still see this, uh, this sort of stigma happening today, right? And some of these things, uh, so what stigma can sound like, it can be like, oh, it's all in your head. You're making this up. You know, some people might say, just think positive or look at the bright side. And you might hear also people saying like, oh, you're being too dramatic, right? Or you're too sensitive. So when they want to open up and they hear all these statements, they hear all these remarks being made, imagine how they would feel to proceed with sharing and opening up it doesn't create that safe space for them anymore, right? So individuals with mental health conditions are also commonly assumed to be lazy, to be weak, to be unintelligent, difficult, or dangerous in that sense. And then when this happens, right, and when we hear these sorts of remarks being made, it can create a feeling of shame and embarrassment to reach out, to even open up about their feelings. Okay, so, yeah. so finally, um, I just wanted to also uh, share that how we can become a mental health advocate for ourselves, for the society and also the community. Because a lot of the time when we talk about becoming a mental health advocate, um, we are important agents of change, like I mentioned earlier, right? So even though we feel like we may be contributing a smaller portion to this movement or to the cause of mental health. The fact that we are trying, the, the fact that we are putting in an effort, I think that says, uh, that says it all, right? So even the fact that you are here today listening to this webinar that I'm sharing with you all today, I think it proves how you value the importance of mental health and also wanting to make a difference, however small that can be um, in the field of uh, mental health awareness and literacy. Okay. All right. So, so going into this, yeah, I think um, before I go into this, I also wanted to hear from everyone in this call. Uh, how are you taking care of your mental health? So what are some of the things that you do to, to relax after a long day at work? You know, uh, what are some of the self-care things that you engage in. So feel free to type in the chat. There's, there's no right or wrong answers. So yeah, so I can see some people already uh, answering, talking with their cat, unwinding through doing hobbies. Okay, so hanging out with friends and family, eating delicious food, yeah. Going on holiday, okay. So playing games, reading novels, exercising, sleep, Netflix, okay, <laughs> enjoying time with the kids, okay, appreciating nature, that's a good one, okay, yeah, eating, sleeping well, staying away from negative people, shopping, walking, right, so, so it seems that you have your own ways of taking care of yourself and you have your go-to activities that you can do uh, to de-stress, to unwind and to just relax, right? So journaling, yeah, that's very good. Chat being statement, okay. <laughs> all right, okay, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. I think these are all great activities that you guys are 
currently doing at the moment. So keep up with that. And so I think when it comes to taking care of our, our mental health, I would like to actually share this particular framework. Um, so this is actually from a campaign that was actually done in Australia um, to help people become mentally healthy and to become uh, focusing on their well-being and such, right? So the framework is the ABC framework. So act, doing something active. B, belong, doing something with someone. And C, commit, doing something meaningful. So I think when it comes to being better mental health advocates, it has to start from ourselves, right? Because we cannot really help or support another person if we ourselves are not feeling our best. Right. So the fact that we are taking care of our mental health is important for us to also be better able to show up and also to care and support others. Right. So we'll go through this one by one. So number one, act, uh, doing something active. So this is where you can keep mentally, uh, socially, spiritually and also physically active. Right. So I think the main uh, key points is having a good nutrition. So having uh, a balanced meal and also taking care of what you eat. Because sometimes when it comes to nutrition, uh, what some of the foods that we eat can also affect our mental health um, states. So being mindful of what you eat is also important. And physical exercise, I think some people um, shared here in the chat that they go exercising. I think yeah, I see a lot of people putting in physical exercise there. So that's good. So yeah, physical exercise can definitely be um, a way to actually boost your mood and also your feel good hormones, right? Because when you exercise, uh, you release endorphins and also dopamine. And these hormones make uh, your mood uh, better, right? So allocating some time for physical activity. And I think the most important thing when it comes to physical activity, it has to be something that you enjoy doing rather than seeing it as something that, okay, I have to do this exercise for this amount of time and then it becomes very stressful for you right and you cannot maintain it or sustain it in the long run so find something that you enjoy doing and something that you find doable for you to do and to add in your daily routine and then thirdly sleep so sleep is another big factor um, that sometimes go unrecognized right so i think having important uh, having quality sleep is very important uh, for us all, especially when uh, we want to focus on losing weight, for instance, right, or manage our stress. I think sleep plays a very big role in helping with that. So make sure that you are getting enough hours of sleep at night and also to maintain good sleep hygiene. And then uh, finally, locus of control. So I think a lot of the time when I talk to my clients or my members that come to me, they always share that or oh, I have this, 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 and this that I'm thinking of right now, and I'm just so stressed, I'm just so overwhelmed, I don't know what to do, I feel so stuck, right? So it's important to actually look at what is within your control, right? So when it comes to looking at what is within your control, is looking to see whether these thoughts, these worries that you have, is it something that you, that you can do something about, right? Is it something that I can take action with? And if it's not, then I think it's good to so slowly or gently let it go or find someone um, to share that with if it is bothering you. All right. So having um, so knowing what you can control and knowing what are the things that you can't control is also important to help keep you mentally healthy. And then be belong. So doing something with someone. So I think as individuals, we are wired for connection, right? So we are, uh, we crave for a sense of belongingness, a sense of identity, and to feel like we are part of something or a part of a group. So that's why it's important for us to also be involved with um, and connect with other people in our social circles, people who give us a positive energy in that sense, right? And these individuals can you know be our family members our co-workers um the group that we attend to so even joining groups participating in community activities these are all ways that you can um, connect with the people that are in the same uh, like-minded as you right so doing something with someone 
and I, I can see that even you know some some of the things that you shared with me like accompanying your kids and going back to your hometown and what are some of the other things that you shared here so yeah so these are hanging out with friends and family so this is um where this comes in right uh, so doing something with someone and then c commit uh, doing something meaningful so this is where you do things that provide meaning and also purpose in life such as taking up challenges supporting causes and also helping others right so i just wanted to share um, when I was back in university, so we had this uh, center for students to come in, especially international students who are living abroad, right? So, and they actually recruited volunteers uh, from the local community who are the elderly people. So the elderly are the volunteers who come into the university. They spend a few hours to interact, to, um, to connect with the students and also to help them out with uh, the local community or activities. Or places so i think this is another great initiative um, that shows how we can do something meaningful at whatever age we are at right so this is uh, another aspect of this okay so now that we know how to take care uh, and what we can do to take care of our own uh, mental health our own well-being but can, what can we do to take care of others, right? And I get this question a lot um, also because sometimes uh, people might come to me and ask, hey, Hanani, uh, I noticed my friend or someone uh, from work is not really like themselves, but I don't know how to approach them. I don't know what, what to ask or um, what to do, right? Even though I see them not doing well, I'm, I'm kind of afraid to approach them and so on. So how can we start? A conversation about mental health. So one of the three things that I would like to share with you all today is um, it's very simple. So number one, check in. Number two, practicing active listening. And number three, offering support. So don't worry, we'll go through this one by one. So when we want to check in, right? So when we want to check in, checking in is not only checking in with the other person but it also refers to checking in with ourselves, right? So you need to ask yourself, am I in the right headspace to talk right now? And is it the right time to approach that person? And is the environment or is the, is the room that I'm in comfortable enough and private enough for me to talk to that person? So these are questions that you can ask yourself first, right? And once you're ready, you can then find or use a situation to find a common ground. So you might not want to startle the person straight away by asking them directly. So you can ease into that conversation, right? So you can find a recent, a current or a future event that you both have went to, or maybe like a training that you both have gone to and you can just check in with that person like, hey, um, we went to that training together. How did you find it? Um, I noticed you were quite stressed um, at the end. Like, how are you doing? So something like that, you can ask them, right? And secondly, practicing active listening. So I think this is very, very important and such a vital skill that we can all learn, right? So active listening is a way of listening and responding to another person that improves mutual understanding. So what are the ways that we can do to practice active listening? So number one is to be fully present, right? Uh, and to pay attention. So when we are fully present, we pay attention, it shows that we are genuinely wanting to know how the other person is doing and we want to help them and support them. So avoid any distractions if you can, put away your phones, put away your laptop, all the notifications, you can mute them and just try to, to be present for that person. And also maintaining good eye contact asking open-ended questions so when we ask open-ended questions it can lead um, it can give them the freedom to answer right because oftentimes when we ask um, close-ended questions they answer yes or no and sometimes we don't know how to proceed with that so when we ask open-ended questions the how the what and so on i think that can open up more room for them to answer and then finally reflecting what you hear so it's okay if you don't know um 
if you are not sure of what they shared with you. Um, so you can always clarify. Like, hey, I noticed that uh, you shared with me that you weren't feeling well after the training. Is that right? Am I understanding this correctly? So you can always use um, clarifying and also paraphrasing as a way to reflect and show that you have been listening to them. And finally, uh, and thirdly, um, offering support. So this is where you can identify what support would be helpful for them. So is it emotional support? Is it practical suggestions? Or is it mental health support? And also, um, one of the things that's very important when we want to offer support is to take into account the situation and the individual readiness to seek help. Um, so I say this because sometimes people, uh, they are not ready to seek support, right? Because oftentimes we can go into this problem solver mode and we just want to help them solve their problems, right? When that is not something the other person wants and it can create more stress for them. So be mindful of that. And if they're not ready to seek help, then that's fine. That's okay. Uh, you can say to them, you can leave the door open for them and you can let them know that you are there for them. Right. So, uh, for example, like, hey, I know uh, you're not ready to seek help right now or to, to connect with a mental health professional. That's OK. I'm here for you. I'll be here um, if you need anything. So they know that you are always there and also reachable for them to access you. Right. OK, so I think we might not go into uh, this quiz. Um, if we have time but yeah okay so i think i'll just go straight into this part um the community so what can we do as a community right so uh, i would like to share with you all the three e's which is enabling a peer support network equip individuals with mental health training and also e engaging through awareness programs so we can go through this one by one just to see so number one, enabling a peer support network. So people with life experiences can be important first line providers of support. Right? So these are individuals who have gone through major uh, mental health conditions like anxiety or depression and they have recovered. Right? They have recovered in that journey and these can be important individuals that can help um, in change and also implementing change, be it in policy making, be in the organization, be in the community. So they can provide a sense of practical and also emotional support with activities in the community. And one of the things that is important is because these individuals, they display or they manifest hope in others, right? So recovery is possible for those who are going a mental health condition, right? So there is that sense of hope that they can bring to the other people in their social circles, in their network. And I believe these people can be um, a good first line support for the others in the community. Okay. So secondly, equipping with mental health training. I think a lot, um, a lot of the organizations and corporate companies, they are doing a lot of initiative with training managers and also people in the organizations um, to be more informed about mental health, to be informed about the signs and symptoms that they can look out for. So trainings like mental health first aid training, I think can help a lot in the early detection of mental health distress. And when we have early intervention, we're able to detect it at an earlier rate. It can also lead to faster recovery and treatment for those who needs it. And I think one of the main thing also with mental health training is that it is creating a safe space for people to come forward, for people to share about their concerns without being judged, without being stigmatized, right? So I think that's the main key point that we hope more people will be able to access and uh, participate in these mental health trainings uh, that we offer. And finally, engaging through awareness programs, right? So I believe awareness programs can be done in many ways, in many forms. Uh, it can be in the form of public educational programs, 
It can be in the form of outreach booths or sharing sessions. And this type of platform, it creates um, a, a, a way and also a space for people to come forward, to ask questions, to share their experiences, to share their thoughts and feedback and so on. And one of the things that it can also do is to address misconceptions about mental health, because we can hear a lot of things from social media, right? And we don't know whether it's, it's true or it's valid or not. So when we have mental health professionals there to help address these misconceptions, it can be um, a way forward to make individuals and the society more informed and more literate about mental health and also introducing mental health screening tools. So I think we have a number of um, screening tools to, to see your mental health state and how you are doing in terms of your mental well-being. So I think these are good to introduce during these awareness programs where the public can access these information and resources. All right, so Okay, so I guess um, this would be the end of my um, webinar sessions. If there are any questions, do let me know. I'll just have a look at some of the questions that we do have. Okay, so all right, so I, I see a few questions already. So one of it is how to know if we are in low performance? Is it work performance? Um, yeah, so I think I'm I'm guessing that this is referring to the mental health continuum uh, just now. So I think when it comes to having low performance, it, it relates back to functioning, right? So are you able to function well within your work, within the other aspects of your life also, like doing your daily chores, daily routines? Um, and also, I think a, a big thing is also in, in work performance. Is it affecting your ability to focus, to complete your tasks? Do you procrastinate? I think procrastination is also something that uh, individuals who may have some sort of um, mental health conditions or struggling with their mental health, they tend to procrastinate the tasks that they are doing uh, and so on. So I think it's, it's good to identify first um, in what areas of your life you are mainly struggling with. So if it's work, then you can see whether um, there, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but the main thing is to see whether you are able to do your work uh, effectively, productively, is there any other stress that you are experiencing at work that is contributing to that? So it's worth noting all these things down. Okay, so this, uh, I think the second question that I see here um, is that coping and struggling seems quite alike. How to better differentiate these two categories? Yep, that, that's a very, very good question. So uh, thank you for asking that. So yes, coping and struggling um, uh, so I think referring to the mental health continuum again in the yellow and also the orange zone, right? So for those individuals who are coping and for those individuals who are struggling, I think the main difference that we need to take note of is um, the ability and also is the ability for, for them to respond well, right? To the stress source that they are feeling. So are they able to cope and manage? So for those who are in the yellow zone, in the coping zone, even though they are experiencing a lot of stress or daily hassles in their life, but the main difference is that it is still manageable and it is still within their ability to control the stress that they are feeling, right? But for those who are struggling, that's when it might seem a bit out of control, right? They, they, can't, they can't really um, do their work. Uh, they can't uh, focus as much as they used to. Uh, they start to withdraw from other people. So they are struggling and they are not able to cope or manage well with the stress that they are experiencing. So I hope, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so let me just 
Let's see. Okay, so I, I see another question. Um, any, any tips to do when anxiety or panic attack during work? Okay, so anxiety or panic attacks during work is something that can happen, right? Especially when uh, the demands of work is getting to us and it just becomes a bit uncontrollable. So one of the things that I encourage people to do when they're feeling anxious or when they're feeling um, some sort of a panic attack coming is to practice grounding techniques, right? So grounding techniques is a type of mindfulness technique that can help bring your mind to the present. Because when you are anxious, your mind is just wandering, right? Like thinking of, okay, what if this happens? What if that happens? Um, what if, um, you know, all these possible circumstances and situations that can create a lot of anxiety for you, right? So when that happens, um, some people can, can become overwhelmed, right? So when you practice grounding, so one of the exercises that I usually recommend to some of my clients or members is the uh, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 um, grounding technique. So identify five things that you can see, four things that you can hear, three things that you can smell, two things that you can touch, one things that you can, um, you can taste, for example. Right? So these are uh, one type of exercise that can bring back your mind to the present moment and to help you refocus your attention to other things. Okay, so I see a, a lot more questions coming in. Uh, another question is what, sorry, uh, let me just see. Okay, so do we need any certification to be a mental health advocate? For this one, I think um, there's, there's multiple ways to go about it. You don't necessarily need a certification, but if you would like to be in that line of support, um, to support other individuals, to be aware of the signs, uh, the mental health uh, first aid training usually offers certifications. Um, because some organizations I know they do offer mental health first aid trainings with certification that you can also use and so there's an informal way of doing it where you can just be informed um, of the signs and symptoms that you need to look out for and educate other people about it and educate uh, your social circle about it and there's also the formal way where you go for trainings where you go for seminars and so on to um, get the certifications right yep um Okay, so another question, uh, what is the difference between psychologist and counsellor? How to know whom to seek support from, psychologist or counsellor? Okay, thank you so much for this question. I think this is a great question. Um, so the difference between, the main difference between uh, a clinical psychologist or a counsellor is that uh, someone with a clinical psychologist background, they can uh, provide assessment and also diagnose of the mental health conditions that you are experiencing, right? So for example, if you are concerned about the anxiety that you are feeling and it's been persistent for two weeks and above and you want to seek guidance and assessment whether you are diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. So that way you can go to a clinical psychologist. Um, but for counsellors, uh, we are not able to diagnose. Um, we can do talk, uh, talk therapy and consultations but for the diagnosis part it's not something that counselors would do so this would go to the psychologist the clinical psychologist right so i, I hope that answers your question okay so let me just see what other questions that we have um Okay, so I, I noticed there's a question on procrastination just now. So does that mean that if a person tend to procrastinate so much, it means that they might have an issue? Okay, so procrastination is just the, uh, probably the symptom, right? So there might be an underlying factor that causes someone to procrastinate. 
So it could be um, a fear of failure, um, it could be a fear of rejection, and also um, having an, un, you know, unrealistic expectations. So actually, it's good to go deeper into what is the root cause of their procrastination issue that they are experiencing. Is it because they are afraid to, to make mistakes or to mess up with the work or tasks that they do? Or is it something else? So it's actually good to uh, have more conversations and probe a bit more deeper into why they are procrastin procrastinating in that way, right? So it might not necessarily mean they have issues. Uh, that might also be a way for them to cope. So I think further questions is needed for us to better understand the person's situation in that sense. Okay, so do we have more time for questions or? So, okay. Um... Okay, so I think I can answer uh, one, one more question here. So how about if you are performing at work, uh, joining social activities, active in the office, but also being stressed with life and having suicidal thoughts? Yes, so I think this is quite, um, this is something that often happens to individuals or to people that I meet sometimes. They seem to be doing okay with work. They seem fine on the outside. Um, they seem to be joining activities or performing well at work. But then when you actually talk to them, right, when you sit down with them, they, they, there's so many stresses that they are feeling. There are so many things that on their mind and suicidal thoughts can be one of them, right? So when this happens, I, I do hope that you don't keep this to yourself and know that you are not alone. There's always um, support available for you, right? You can always reach out to the Naluri team. And if you would like to... Um, talk to someone. We also have uh, psychologists and counselors that you can talk to and schedule appointment and uh, consultation sessions with. Okay. Okay, so maybe I, I answer another, another question that I Miss, I think this is the earlier questions. Um, is it true coffee can make more anxiety? Right. Interesting question. Thank you so much for um, asking this. I think it really depends because um, each person's body mechanism is different. Some people are more um, okay with taking caffeine at a higher level compared to other people. So it, it really depends on you uh, because I know myself, I'm, I'm not good with coffee. It does elevate my... Um, anxiousness sometimes. So I prefer tea. So some people, they might um, find coffee more, um, you know, relevant for them to, to function well at work and so on. So, but I think there are studies that shows coffee, there are some interconnection between coffee and anxiety. I'm not sure I have to look into that also. But if you would like to know more about that, um, you can always reach out to me at my email. So hanani at naluri.life for that. Okay, so okay, I think another question. Um, can psychologists prescribe medication to the patient, but a counselor can't? Am I right? Yes, that's right. Uh, thank you for asking that, Kenneth. Um, yeah, so psychologists they cannot uh, provide medications uh, to the patient. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, so I, I was just reading this um, differently. So uh, psychologists cannot provide uh, medication to the individuals or clients, and also a counselor cannot do that. So the only individual or the only mental health professional that can provide uh, medications is actually the psychiatrist because they have a medical background and they are able and certified to provide medications uh, and prescriptions to individuals. But for psychologists, for counselors, they cannot provide medications and only uh, can provide uh, therapy, talk therapy, okay? All right, okay, so I think we've, we've gone um, quite over time. So I think um, for now, I will 
I stopped taking in the questions. And before I end my slide today, I do have this um, short uh, announcement to make. So do take the Naluri Mental Health Assessment if you can. And you can just um, use this QR code and scan this QR code to identify your risk for depression, anxiety, stress, and burnout. And you can also go to this link, www.naluri.life slash WMHD2023. Okay. So before I end my session today, I just wanted to thank everyone uh, for joining the session today and for asking your questions and also for participating uh, in the quizzes and questions that I shared. I hope this will be a beneficial session for each and every one of you and you are able to take home some key pointers, key takeaways from this session today. And I just wanted to remind um, us all that we are capable of change, of making a change, and we are all important agents of change. And however small uh, we think our contribution might be, it does make a difference. So thank you so much for joining today.